Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the ABM. Um, as the chair already explained, the topic for today is the challenge for the European project. And uh, we have today three speakers that uh, come from very different backgrounds, but they will all have been working in the past years on uh, contributing to help uh, Europe work much better in their own fields. Um, the current crisis, apart from uh, economical, it has also had a very strong impact on uh, how Europe is perceived by the European citizens. As we know, uh, every time that the European institutions focus uh, their attention and decide to prioritize economical reasons uh, over uh, citizens, there is a decrease on the perception on, on Europe, and this is creating a lot of problems. Uh, probably in the future, uh, we will see in the, in the next European elections, maybe the amount of participation will be decreasing. We also see that the involvement of uh, people uh, and attachment of people to the European project is decreasing. We have, I mean, there is always, uh, Euroscepticism has always existed, but we have seen now a, ra a rise in the amount of uh, support that these parties are getting in their national elections. We also see that the extreme parties on both sides of the political spectrum are gaining support and this is kind of worrying because it reminds us uh, something that happened in the past and they were the, the reason why the European Union was created. So this, there is a crisis in the European project and uh, I think it's needed that uh, European young people uh, gather all together and ask that we believe in the European project. We have to work now very hard. We have to fight against this trend in Europe and uh, I hope within Asia we can put our small contribution to this uh, battle against the, the, the European de deception of the European uh, sadness or European, uh, let's say, Euroscepticism. And I think um, here within Asia we have a real tool to fight because we are a group of ideal idealists. We know what we want, we know Europe very well. Uh, or let's say much better than the rest of the people. So we have a task of uh, spread the word. We, we have a task of uh, communicate all the successes that the European project has brought to the European citizens. And I think um, this, uh, the speeches that our presenters will uh, introduce you will be the beginning of a whole day where we'll work on how to improve the, the future of the European project. And I really invite you to work hard and to bring uh, innovative ideas and bring recommendations during the work in the groups that can later be put forward in the table of the political responsibles. So we give them ideas on how to uh, solve this problem in the future. So now I would like to present you the, the three speakers. The first one is James Kelly. He's a very good friend of IJ. He has been present in some of our statutory events. He is a university professor. His work uh, covers many different fields, uh, from European identity to crisis resolution. And um, well, I'm sure you will enjoy his speeches. We have always had uh, the pleasure of, of listening to him in our statutory events. Second speaker will be Ruben, Ruben Lotz, uh, former Secretary General of uh, JEF, one of our partner organizations. And, uh, they share uh, a vision of Europe that I'm sure you will uh, find uh, has some points in common with, uh, with ours. And uh, I'm not going to say more because I don't want to bring spoilers to the table, but I'm sure that you will find a lot of common points with our ideas. And then the last one will be Burchu, Burchu Bacerme. She's a former IG member and she has done uh, quite a lot of things in, in IG. She doesn't want to say much more about her. But I'm sure that whatever she's going to tell us will speak by itself. So I would like to invite uh, the first speaker, James. Good morning. Is it, is, does this work? Oh, there we go. Good morning, everybody. It's, um, it's a delight to be here again at uh, an AJ meeting. I, I'm particularly fond of AJ for a number of reasons, um, most fully because unlike many of the people who are concerned with constructing Europe, shall we say, AJ members are building Europe from below. 
And I have to say that I have very little question that in the end, your initiative will be much more successful than those who try to build it from above. The other part of <clears throat> what I think is interesting about IJ is that there are no national chapters. And since we're talking about identity today, I thought I'd start with that. If I was presenting what I'm presenting to you now as an academic paper, I think I might title it Beyond Identity, and for very good reasons, as I think you'll see. Um, building Europe from below raises the question of a European identity. But what kind of identity is it? Is it like the identities we've seen at national level? Is it one that, in the end, depends upon a negative other? In other words, most of us are socialized to understand ourselves as, as Irish or French, etc. But that always implies, implicitly, you have to understand that if you're Irish, there has to be a negative other, right? In the Irish case, it's often the British, right? With some justification. <laughs> but, but you really do need to, to see that it, that negative other becomes part of the problem in any socialization project to identity, certainly at national level and perhaps at subnational level as well. Implicit in it, I think, is a project that can, under the worst of social circumstances, lead to genocide, as it has in Europe at various moments in history. Um, one of the people who has been an IJ activist for many years is a, is a good friend of mine, Christian Eichenmuller from Germany. And Christian, um, told me that his many years working with IJ made him feel less German and more European, which is a sentiment I fully applaud. Uh, and it gives you that kind of example that I think we need of the transcendence of a narrow national identity. Um, but I would argue that the story can't stop there. We can't stop at a European identity. I would argue, actually, that in the end, we have to transcend the category identity. Because if we don't, we keep ourselves in a position of subservience to certain kinds of powerful interests. Let me tell you two stories. Um, well, first, to understand, some people do need to continue to struggle at the level of identity. I've spent the last five years in Northern Ireland, right, which some people refer to as the occupied territories. Right? <laughs> what, what you see in Northern Ireland is the need to struggle as Irish for a degree of national liberation. But if it stops there, if one comes to think that there is an essence, that all the way down someone is deeply Irish, then we have a problem. There are two little anecdotes. The first has to do with a Jewish tourist in Belfast. Now, there are not a lot of Jews in Belfast. And so he's walking along the street one day, and he turns a corner and finds himself in the middle of a demonstration. And the leaders of the demonstration come up to him and say, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? I'm not either. I'm Jewish great consternation among the leaders of the demonstration. They go back and huddle for a moment or two, and then one of them comes up to him and says, but are you a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew? <laughs> it is this digitization of identity, if you will. My, in my own experience, <clears throat> some years ago, at a particular moment in my life, I was thinking of applying for a position at Goldsmith College in London. One of the forms I got as part of the application process was the Equal Employment Opportunity Form. Now, here's what it said, and you were meant to fill this out and send it in with the other materials. It said, I would describe myself as, and then in parentheses, check one. Now, the first category was white. Hmm? Uh, and then the remaining 13 categories were all remnants of the British Empire. Pakistani, Black Caribbean, uh, Black African, all these kinds of categories. 
that's right. The final category was Irish. <laughs> so I, 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 I had, was, there was something of a dilemma. Should I describe myself as white or should I describe myself as Irish? <laughs> yes. This digitized identity, and, and uh, I've been having some discussions with Felipe Santos about this, because <clears throat> this is what's happening very broadly. All of you are aware of how much your identities are now the object of interest by both states and corporations, and even Facebook, with, uh, <laughs> with which so many people are complicit. And I'll tell you a story about Facebook that I found interesting. I was talking to a Hungarian professor whose, whose uncle had been part of the Hungarian secret police during the communist era. And, and his, his uncle was a high-ranking colonel, or whatever you would have been called in, in the secret police. And his, his uncle said to him, you know, I wish we'd had this thing fake called Facebook. It would have made our work so much easier. <laughs> And so we want to think about the way in which our identities are being determined by others. And I think we also want to be conscious of the fact that any of these definitions, in the end, when they're done by others, is an act of power. Hmm? If I define you in national or other terms, if I use certain kinds of adjectives, I'm exercising a kind of power. Um, when it's done by yourself, unwittingly, you are often complicit with power. So you need to be thinking about how you deploy your own identity. What do you say about yourself? Do you say, I'm British, I'm Irish, I'm French? Or do you say something else? Hmm? You say, for example, uh, I live within the political jurisdiction of France. Hmm? Or do you think that there's an essence way down deep? I had a student in my class at the University of Ulster last year who was an Irish Republican nationalist. And, you know, fighting for the uh, freedom of people in Northern Ireland from British rule. And, and I used to ask him, I mean, he was vehement about this. He, was, he told everybody in the class that he was on a terrorist watch list and couldn't therefore go to the United States. I think this was actually a, a way of chatting up the American girls and saying, hey, I'm really cool. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, I mean, how many terrorists do you get to go and have a beer with? <laughs> and, 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 um, he was a very sweet guy, however. And, but I used to challenge him to say, well, look, when did the Irish become Irish? You know, I mean, after all, what, what most people will tell us, the scientists who've studied this, is that humans came out of the Rift Valley in Kenya some several millennia ago, and somewhere along the line they became Irish, they became French, they became whatever we call ourselves. And this, um, you know, it, it gets to this issue. There is no essence. All of these identities are social constructions. Um, I want to read um, a couple of things to you. So I, I'm beginning to argue, I'm involved in a rather large uh, research project trying to sketch out a new conceptual basis for identity. And part of me feels like saying that no one has the right to tell you who you are, not the state, not the priests, not your parents, not your teachers. They can say what they will about behavior, but their acts of definition are acts of unmitigated power, regardless of whether they are so-called compliments or denigrations. One book that I would recommend to everybody is the book by Amin Malouf. It's called In the Name of Identity, violence and the need to belong. He argues that identity is a, quote, false friend, and that consequently we desperately need a new concept of identity. It is, this is Malu saying this now, it is often the way we look at them that may set them free. 
He is criticizing our tendency, and again I quote, to lump the same people together under the same heading. For example, when we say that, quote, the Serbs have massacred, the English have devastated, or the Jews have confiscated, etc. The task, Malu says, is for each of us to become aware that our words are not innocent and without consequence. They may help to perpetuate pre prejudices which history has shown to be perverse and deadly. It is with this in mind that our words are not innocent and without consequence that I focused my attention on the centrality of language to the socially constructed and deeply problematic character of identity because our usage of language and the construction of identities is often unwitting, certainly unreflective, and has engendered horrific consequences for tens of millions of human beings. The basic thesis is that having an identity appears to solve an existential problem, who we are, and to an extent, the corollary problem of why we are on this planet. However, given that the process of acquiring an identity is facilitated through the central role of language in socializing us to our place in the social world, especially with regard to establishing an individual identity, the intrinsic inability, and I won't go into this very deeply, but the intrinsic inability to establish a stable sign and a fixed sign for oneself means that a language-based identity is inherently fragile. It is this inherent fragility that causes us to often desperately assert our identities, even though we also sense that such friendships, if you will, are less than authentic. And therefore, too, for many people, life becomes an odyssey of escape and attempted escapes from the crypts the sarcophagi that identity entombs us in, whether it's through drink, drugs, sexuality, sectarianism, or even in some cases, prayer. Thus the task is to see if we can articulate a way of thinking about identity that is not overly dependent on language, and which might free us to overcome sectarian modes of thinking and engage in much deeper forms of solidarity with our fellow humans. I have a couple more minutes, I think. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to make sure we got to a couple of points here uh, that I, I think are terribly uh, important. Um, there's a great deal of work, interesting work, by the psychologist Eric Erickson on identity. For those of you who have a psychological orientation, I, I hope you've read some of this. One of, he starts his work on identity with an analysis of the life of Martin Luther, hmm? who founded some churches, I believe. Uh, <laughs> I think some of them are national churches, actually, um, yeah, as in Denmark. Um, Luther is reputed to have made the following statement, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. Um, that statement provided a credo for those who, quote, according to Erickson, would stand on their own feet, not only spiritually, but politically, economically, and intellectually. No matter what happened afterward, Luther's emphasis, and this is important for every one of us, Luther's emphasis on individual conscience prepared the way for the series and concepts of equality, representation, and self-determination, which became in successive secular revolutions, the foundations not of the dignity of some, but the liberty of all. I want to also note that Luther's translation of the Bible into the German vernacular contributed not only to the subsequent flowering of German literature, but the subsequent cultivation of national vernaculars as a part of the growing nationalism that occurred over the last several centuries, and that to this day dominate our world. Luther, as a child, had been caned, he had been whipped for speaking German in a Latin school. And as Erickson says in his analysis of this process, 
Luther later used that language with a vengeance, and its use would contribute to the then embryonic national identity of Germany. Mahatma Gandhi and other nationalists would also recognize the centrality of a national language to the construction of a national identity. Gandhi, for example, attempting to throw off the yoke of the British Raj, charged his countrymen that, and I quote, to this day we have not begun conducting our national business in Hindi because of our cowardice, lack of faith, and ignorance of the greatness of the Hindi language. Now, if you stop there, unfortunately, you will see once again this dependence on otherness. You know who you are by knowing who you are not. So where should we start with the construction of new concepts? Maluf has part of the answer. He suggests that we begin to think of identity in horizontal fashion, not <coughs> vertical fashion. In other words, there's no essence deep down. Hmm? As the saying goes, it's elephants all the way down. There's nothing underneath it. This was the difficulty of my student friend at the University of Ulster. <coughs> and you need to watch the use of language. If you say, I am, and this interesting verb, to be, hmm? I am, you are creating part of that process. One needs to step back and say, I hold citizenship in, etc., etc. Not that I am British. Hmm? Um, and by way of suggesting and closing how difficult this process is, we are all surrounded constantly by the symbols of banal nationalism. Those of you interested in nationalism, I hope you've read or will read Michael Billig's book on banal nationalism, which shows how the symbols of nationalism and national identity permeate every aspect of life. Hmm? You find flags everywhere. Hmm? It's particularly prevalent in the United States, and so I brought a little symbol of that today. It seems to me that it, it, it captures more than anything how pervasive banal nationalism is. And I'm, in fact, I'm thinking of creating an annual award for the most banal nationalist symbol. And this one would certainly capture it. This is a child's, what they call in some English languages, a pacifier or soother. You're meant to put it in your mouth, you know, or the child's mouth. And as you may be able to see, it has a tiny little American flag on the back. <laughs> now, this is not something that is just <clears throat> available to Americans, but you can get it made with any flag you would like. Hmm? You can get one with Cro the Croatian flag on it, uh, the German flag, whatever. So that your child, from a very early age, can learn to suck on its national identity. Hmm? <laughs> Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for exposing how bad uh, moderator I can be when the speaker is, is good, because I think uh, I, I wasn't very successful at keeping the time, but I could not cut it. So I hope the next speaker, I hope the next speaker don't take advantage of my weakness. Um, now it will be the time for Ruben. I immediately a proposal, maybe we should make this kind of sort of a little European flag on it or something. With the, uh, the Ajay symbol. Exactly, with the Ajay symbol. Just with the Ajay symbol. <laughs> like, one of the questions uh, that we're supposed to tackle over today is like, what does it mean to be European and from when onwards like, do you feel European? And then to follow up on uh, James' very, James's very in, in inspiring speech, um, like, when I started to feel European was in 2007 when I was, like, I was, from, like, I was doing my Erasmus exchange in Tallinn in Estonia and then attending my first international seminar in Denmark, uh, my, 
course, the International Chef Seminar. I'm from the Young European Federalist. Uh, and then after this international seminar, um, with like 30 different nationalities present, uh, flying back to Estonia and feeling like I'm flying back home. Now, that's great. I'm, I'm Estonia. I'm living in Estonia, living a resident in Estonia. And I feel, I feel home while I'm actually, I hope, citizenship of Belgium. Uh, but then at the time, <laughs> um, subject to political jurisdiction of, uh, of Estonia. Um, while now at the moment I still hold citizenship of Belgium and I am subject to uh, the political jurisdiction of Turkey at the moment, but I still feel as European as I felt at the time, or even more, like over the years, being involved in this European uh, youth work. Like, it's an identity, and you, identity you're building, you're, you're, you dive into this identity, you're building it from, from inside yourself. And as James also said, it's not a matter of putting the one higher up than the other. It's not like a vertical uh, way of seeing it, but more horizontal. It's like, I'm as much European as I could be Belgian or Flemish or a um, like, person that grew, grew up in a little town of Turnhout or as atheist or as whatever I could be. So it's, it's very, like, let's not put the things, the one thing higher up than, uh, than the other. Um, so in 2007, I started being active in Jeff, uh, the Young European Federalist, and actually on the European level, Jeff and I are working together very much. Um, I would like to see this cooperation also more on the uh, on the national on, on the local level, but one of these cooperations would already not be possible because IGA doesn't have national levels, as also James said, and that is also why I very much envy all of you that you got rid of this. I mean, you actually, IGA never had any national levels, and this is something you can be extremely proud of, I think. I mean, you are working towards, uh, like, a European ideal, uh, and you work with your local, I mean, you think it across borders. In fact, in IGA, there are no borders, and that is something what makes you very strong and unique as a network, and what makes me very jealous as being someone coming from the Federalist organization, young European Federalist, promoting a federal, federally organized Europe, but still where actually everything is decided by like our statutory meetings, where everything is decided by our um, <coughs> national sections. I see some contradiction there. <laughs> um, still, that doesn't make that we're um, that we're doing useless things. Uh, I believe. Um, especially because the political work that we are doing or trying to do, um, like we really try to promote uh, like a more federal Europe. Of course, what does that mean? Um, it serves as an answer to the challenges we are facing today. We are painfully observing that uh, in the European Union, the member states alone, and nor the European Union as it's, uh, as, it's, uh, as it is today. Uh, can meet the challenges uh, we are facing these days, uh, which are, I mean, the management of the European economy, and as we can see, the, the euro going down, down, down. Um, secondly, and this concerns uh, like more the citizens on the European, on, on an individual level, the mass unemployment. Like, why can't we like find a way to tackle this on, on the European level? Um, thirdly, also the challenges of globalization and the ever-increasing world disorder. Um, national member states take, um, can just not solve this type of things within their own <coughs> political jurisdiction. And also the European Union, as it says today, cannot deal with this. Um, so both nationalism and intergovernmentalism, they are not able to catch up with like, the new elements that are brought up by this uh, globalized world. So we need to transform the European Union into like, a true European Federation. Um, because without a stronger, like a stronger, further integration, it, um, like we really risk to, to, like we put at stake the, 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 the 60 year, um, like what, what we gained in these last 60 years. Um, since the European integration process started after the Second World War, like we really like risk to, to lose 
the achievements of these uh, 60 years and to lose the achievements of um, the, the very, how to say, the, the, um, at the beginning of the process of uh, European integration, we had politicians and we had European citizens with a vision, with a European vision. Um, like I think like, like Paul Martin Spack, for instance, like someone with, with vision on the European level, which is, I mean, name me one in like at nowadays in nowadays political like uh, life in, in, in Europe who has the European vision. I mean like it's lacking at all at all levels. Uh, so we really would like to we really risk to to, to do this six years of um, what we like if if I look at what the European Federalists have been doing, first of all um, the Council of Europe uh, in 1949, has been actually set up as a result of um, of the convention, like the, the Congress of the Hague, which was uh, convened by the, the European Federalists. So it's the European Movement International at that time, which was with the European Federalists, who like brought together like all relevant uh, stakeholders in, in, in Europe, and actually out of that meeting, out of that Congress in the Hague, the, the Council of, of Europe was, uh, was set up. Um, European Federalists have always been like a bit ahead, which um, I can read from a, from a, like a political resolution um, of the Federal Committee from 1996 of the European Federalists, saying like the the Monetary Union will not be able to work in the long term without a government of the Union. Um, secondly, um, recalls attention to the fact that the decisions facing the Union make necessary the creation of a real and effective core of the European Federal Union. Um, already at that time, the Euro was going to come, it was known in 1996, the Euro was uh, going to be introduced a few years later, and we were then at that time warning, if you have the Eurozone, if you have a common, if you have a common currency without a common budgetary, uh, monetary uh, approach, it's within 10 years it's gonna collapse. Well, exactly, we're 10 years later and it is all collapsing. It's very depressing uh, to see this. Um, so we started the European integration as some sort of economic project, economic project, uh, trying to develop a single market, but we see that, we see that this uh, integration process has still not, not yet been completed, like, uh, not yet been extended to the entire um, European continent, um, but then also not yet followed by the sufficient political and, and social integration. So this inconsistency leads to, um, to several discrepancies in policies and gaps in the institutional decision making of, uh, of the European Union as we know it today. Um, then also we, of course, uh, like the transfer of certain competences to the, to the European level, um, as we would like to see this, uh, for instance, for this monetary and budgetary um, policies. Um, this needs to be accompanied by the necessary democratic uh, legitimacy to the European level. Um, trying to do stuff on the European level without citizens um, like following it, or actually without it coming from below, as also James indicated, like it needs to be a process that comes from below, from the citizens. So as long as uh, the, the European citizens don't feel that they are being represented by the European level, or as long as they don't feel that um, the, the, the decisions taken on the European level, that they influence their, their daily lives, um, then also the, we cannot expect from the European citizens to believe in the project. Um, so that is that is um, a place where I think organizations such like Jeff and IG have a very very important role to play. Um, but that is also a place where the European politicians really need to put their stuff together and, and, and like work on, on improving this democratic legitimacy. On the one hand, this could be through, um, for instance, tools like the European Citizens Initiative. It's only one of them. I think most of you should have heard of this. Um, it's a brilliant tool where 
by get, gathering one million signatures, uh, we can put something on the European agenda. And the European Commission is obliged to deal with this uh, deal with this issue. It has only been um, installed a couple of months uh, ago. Jeff has, over the last years, doing a lot of efforts to um, to try to make this tool as user friendly and as um, like as easy accessible as uh, as possible. Um, like we were afraid that one million signatures would be would be too much. Um, like that, twelve months would be too little to gather all these one million signatures. Um, but now, actually, we are only a couple of months far, and we see that already one initiative has managed to to catch the one million the needed one million signatures. I think the one on uh, water as a human right. Um, so you can see, I mean, water as a human right is something extremely, like, extremely important. It's something that touches all the citizens of Europe. So whenever people feel that something is really close to their daily reality, I mean, every morning you, you wake up and the first thing you do is I mean, you use water. So everyone needs water in their life. So whenever something is really important, people feel affected by it. So this is also like the European Citizens Initiative is a tool that, like, that can bring issues that people feel close to, to the European agenda. Um, then a second uh, point and a second campaign that also we as Young European Federalists have been uh, working on over the last years is the creation of a pan-European constituency. Um, for the European elections <laughs> next year, 2014, we're going back to the, we're going to the European elections. And in the past decades, uh, like all the last European elections, it, we always saw that there were not European elections in the Belgians. There were just 27 times national elections, or as much as the member states were at the time. In Belgium, like the, the European elections, they are by law like going together with the regional elections. So, I mean, it's about Flemish and Belgian topics. I mean, not one single politician managed to bring the debate to the European level, but why? Because there is just no interest. Because there's no interest in gathering, like collecting these votes on European topics. Because also in, on the European level, you have the European Parliament, uh, mem members of the European Parliament are sitting there, but on the European level, there is no coalition, there's no opposition, there's um, you're voting in politicians anyway, but there's, like, as also James indicated, like, you always, there's always, like, a thing of the other, like, in national politicians, but in national politics, for instance. Um, okay, I would vote for A, but I see that in these five years' uh, time, A is not doing well. So, you can vote for B, which has different ideas on different policies and, and, and as such. On the European level, this is just not possible. You can only vote for A, or you uh, there's there's you can or you can it's like either being pro-European or being like against Europe. At the moment, Europe is not doing well, so we cannot decide on choosing other policies within Europe. No, we just decide to be anti-European. Seeing the race of your skepticism in Europe, and things are not going well. People should be able to decide on a different direction for Europe, on different European policies, but there's not such an opportunity. So people decide to be Eurosceptical, or they don't decide, they just become Eurosceptical. Um, so this is something that we think that with a European wide constituency, that this would sort of be in like counterbalance. Of course, it will not provide like a proper clear cut solution, but it is maybe like a step to bring the debates to the European level, to um, to bring into the European Parliament members of the European Parliament who are representing the ideals of Europe um, and not just the like the interests of the of the different member states. Um, I'm I think I should cut this <laughs> Okay, there were just some other like uh, federalist demands uh, that we have with uh, like as, as European federalists, but I think um, I will leave it here and then I can come back to some other points later when there are some, some questions. So I think we will, uh, will be very happy to speak now. Thank you, Ruben. And um, now I would like to invite.
Murchi to speak, and um, well, I have the, the, the video is telling me this way. Uh, can I call Alberto one moment? Alberto. Okay, thank you. Um, hello. Um, it's always been quite an inspiring and thrilling experience for me to, you know, be with IJ members and operate in IJ jurisdiction. So uh, I'm so grateful for uh, giving me this opportunity to be with you today and also getting to know all these remarkable people around. Uh, I'm very uh, grateful for that. Um, when I learned that the uh, subject of this uh, panel discussion would be about European identity, I was like, I'm having so much struggles with my own identity, so maybe I'm not really the best person to tell me about all these terrible identities and stories of mine. Uh, and then when I heard we can also talk a bit about the challenges that we meet when making this European project uh, happen, uh, I was more happy. Uh, so thanks again also for uh, understanding this. Um, well, I just would like to tell you a bit of where I live and where I stand and who I am or uh, what I'm trying to be. And uh, also I just would like to uh, tell you how I try to find my way in this mess. Um, and thanks to these some um, defining moments that I had in Asia. Uh, and because I will be telling you some, like, some uh, personal stories, I very much count on Miguel. He will just tell me to stop when I had to stop. Um, thank you. <laughs> And the thing is that yes, I am uh, I'm Turkish. Uh, I'm Turkish citizen with Turkish ethnicity also because in my country also have uh, some lots of other identities and ethnicities and we are all defined as Turkish by our constitution. Um, and yes, I am uh, an Asian member. So I still don't know if I feel European or not European, but I know that I really feel very much Asian. Um, which means I really don't uh, understand any borders, I really don't understand many things, what's happening in my country, in Europe, in the world. Uh, so it is some sort of difficult experience for me uh, to live, to stay, to survive, to manage, you know, in this uh, jurisdiction that is called Turkey or Europe. Uh, so I'm really uh, trying to find my way out. I haven't yet, uh, you know, managed to find my way. Uh, but at least, I mean, this experience has been very much transforming for me uh, thanks to some defining moments that I had. So let me start with those defining moments. The first defining moment for me was in 2000 uh, when I joined uh, Aisha Ankara. Um, I mean, I just joined Aisha Ankara really by uh, just pure chance and I had no clue what Aisha was and what those crazy people in Aisha Ankara was doing because they were just organizing this crazy thing that was called Agora uh, and I just found myself in the organization. So it was very nice and very fancy you know, to have all those European friends and to go through all these nice discussions and organizations but I really did not really uh, you know, I mean who I mean is this story, what we are doing and all those things. So then the second defining moment after this other in Ankara, uh, we had some discussions, uh, you know, this European Union, uh, they gave us some money, actually lots of money, to do a project between Turkey and Greece, and I mean we had to either use this money or we need to give back to the Commission, so maybe it's a good idea that we do something with that, and maybe you can be involved in that. And all I knew by that time about Turkey and Greece, uh, because I'm originally coming from a town in Turkey called Kayseri, uh, like Caesarea, maybe in Greek, or Gesari in Armenian. Um, we had lots of beautiful, beautiful Greek houses and, and villages, and that's all I knew. And I also knew that uh, in 1996, Turkey and Greece was almost, you know, ending up in a war because of a very tiny, not even an island, but some rocky <laughs> uh, islet. And in those days, it was quite uh, tense, the escalation. And despite all those things, um, there was Aja Istanbul, there was Aja Ankara, and all these locals started cooperating with the ones in Greece, because when Aja Istanbul joined the network, I'm sure you all know the story, the decision was taken by the Agora Inkos in Greece uh, in 1992, I guess 
and there was a reaction uh, from the locals in Greece about a local from Turkey joining the network. So starting from that moment, uh, in this chaotic days, members from Greece and Turkey jointly proposed the Agora to do a project called Peace Academy. So this is what I mean about Aisha and all these people from Greece and Turkey. And it was so great to know that they want to do something together. So when I kind of took over the project, uh, again some people said, you know, we have lots of money, so maybe you should just do a huge conference in Ankara with lots of fancy speakers and lots of visibility, and we just spend the money all at once, and we don't need to care about the budget. But since I had no clue about the subject and no confidence at all, I decided to take some time, like about a year, to travel in Turkey and also in Greece to understand what it is and what is happening. And this was very valuable. Uh, because it was right after the earthquake in Turkey in 1999 where we had some uh, Greek search and rescue teams coming to Turkey and saving lives. And some months later we also had an earthquake in Greece where Turkish uh, you know, rescue teams went to Greece to save lives. And this was just the perfect climate uh, for the relations to kind of you know, uh, get warmer. So I traveled extensively in Greece and Turkey. I found about uh, this exchange of population. Uh, we all knew that in our history box books, but we never understood what it is like right before the establishment of the Republic, after all this Ottoman heritage. Uh, lots of people from uh, Turkey had to leave for Greece, and lots of people from Greece had to leave Turkey. The populations could be exchanged so that we could have our nation states and constructed Greek, Turkish, whatever identities. So I just found this village in Fethiye, and maybe Miguel can help uh, showing that village to you. Uh, this was a village in present-day Turkey, a former Greek village, which is like a ghost village. Um, uh, so there was thousands of Greek people used to live in that village, and with this decision of the governments at that time, they simply had to change their place and go to Greece, and they started their own village there. The name of this village in Turkey was Levisi, Kayakay, and they founded Nea Levisi there, like the new uh, village. Uh, and they had been living there with all those stories from their grandparents. Um, they had never been back to the land, they had no clue, but they had this constant longing uh, for the place. So when I saw this village, and maybe you can already put it on if it works, you will see, you will see how it works. <coughs> The good news is that the houses are still there, um, but it is really like a ghost village, and there was uh, nothing there, no lighting, no visitors. Uh, so we decided perhaps we can I mean, really do something in that village. And what we did is that we invited, we found, and we invited these grandchildren of people who used to live in those houses. Uh, so the entire uh, town of Neamakri and Neanerisi, they were, uh, you know, so nice and they were just uh, coming to join the festival. So this was like a one week of magic, uh, 3,000 people from Greece and Turkey, we had at least 400 uh, people from Greece. And for one week we had all those people coming, uh, we did lots of joint art workshops and so basically we all ended up like... Uh, sharing all those personal stories and spending time at the villagers' houses uh, who were meeting Greeks for the first time in their lives uh, and who were not always so uh, open to see Greeks because Greeks may come anytime back and they may you know, start living there and start their messes in the church and all those stories. So it was this one week of magic. And this uh, magic, uh, in a way, uh, really kind of derailed my life and that's how I continued uh, afterwards. And maybe we can really just study there, I may just show some, show some of the visuals afterwards. Um, the thing is that what we discovered in this Turkish Greek City Dialogue project is that uh, these identities, uh, when those people had to leave Greece uh, and come to Turkey, they were also not welcome as pure Turks they were welcome as strangers. And that was also the case when Greeks had to leave uh, from uh, Turkey to Greece. Uh, I mean, they were still seeing some bit of Turks. So 
uh, when all these people met again after all those years, I mean, there was this very unique identity built across all of those people, and they all felt like, okay, actually, you know what? I mean, it, I'm not so happy about just only being a Greek or, or Turk, and this is not really what matters to me, but our shared identity today is what matters for us. So when I heard that <laughs> thing on that day, um, I, was, I was very happy that this could be possible. And then some, uh, you will still tell me stop when I had to stop. Uh, and that was in 2003, 10 years ago. And after some weeks of this magic, you know, I'm on class, my God, everything is possible in this world and they're really making things happen. I had the chance to go to Cyprus uh, for the first time in my life. It was 2003, uh, we organized a planning meeting in the island for the first time. And we had a local in the north, uh, in the northern Cyprus. Uh, and as you know, uh, Cyprus is still like a divided Euro European Union member state. So when I went there and I saw the buffer zone, uh, I was uh, yeah, very much challenged by what's happening. Uh, the crossings had recently started, but as a uh, citizen of the Republic of Turkey, of course, I couldn't cross. Uh, and I was again asking all those questions about my own identity. Isn't it that you know the border exists also because of our government and because our military is there and now the border is open, people can cross and I can't cross. So all those uh, stupid questions coming along with that. But it was such a great, great experience to be there, uh, to see, and also to see all those interactions between Turkish Cypriots who were not necessarily seeing Turkey as saviors, <laughs> but they were you know quite. Uh, aggressive uh, about all the isolation that Turkey kind of caused also in the island. Uh, so since then I really want to uh, make sure that we really do something nice in Cyprus. So I think it's a unique opportunity that now we have a local vote in the north and in the south, in Nicosia and also in Rosa. Uh, because we you know, don't need to deal with all those borders and, and states and we can do whatever we want. Uh, once I had this fantasy when uh, we were organizing the Agora in Mosa, uh, I thought <laughs> we could do uh, some events in the buffer zone, we could do some events both in south and in the north, even though we did not have an Asia local at that time. I even thought that you know we could have a pre-event, uh, people from Turkey, they can first go to, I don't know, a pre-event by Argentina, and they apply for a Republic of Cyprus visa there, and they can, you know, go to the island from the south and do all these border crossings possible. And likewise, people from Greece, they could come to Turkey, uh, hosted by, I don't know, Asia, Istanbul, Asia, Hungary, and take a flight to the northern part of the island <coughs> and, and do all this crossing, because this is possible. And this is not so risky as that uh, we may be thinking of. Uh, but of course, this was my fantasy. We couldn't make it happen. I am still hoping that one day it will be possible. Uh, but what I really want to say is that Asia can play a huge role in the island um, with our locals. Uh, and there is also this problem of inclusion of uh, Turkish Cypriots uh, because the uh, northern part of Cyprus is not recognized as. Uh, I mean, separate identity, but also because we have Republic of Cyprus and they don't have effective control of the northern part of the island, which is very troubled. Uh, our uh, members uh, from Aizemusa or some Turkish Cypriots who are actually a minority now within their <laughs> northern part as well, because we have many people from Turkey living now there. Um, Inclusion of them is very important because they couldn't take part in Erasmus or they couldn't do EDS. Uh, now, some things are possible thanks to the support of the European community for the inclusion of Turkey cities, but still, these people are kind of isolated. And no matter who created this political problem, be it Turkey, Greece, be it, you know, Cyprus, uh, these young people should not be suffering and really be given the equal opportunities. And uh, this is not only for Cyprus, this is for all the continent or the entire world we're working on, but I think that would be very important. And then, after uh, this experience in Cyprus, uh, and after some time with the uh, project, I ended up in Brussels, uh, spending two years there, and I had the chance uh, to work with the content director at that time. And I will be skipping that part to keep it shorter, because this was a moment when, uh, as a Turkish citizen, 
also I realize as a Muslim person uh, living in Brussels and uh, being challenged how can you ever be European Institutions Director of Project Europe because you are Turkish and you are not an EU member state and all those things and also living in Belgium and you know representing Asia in some meetings as a Turkish uh, person being a Belgian delegate uh, being faced with this Kurdish question, Armenian question, this question and that question. So I had lots of interesting stories also from uh, those moments, but I really don't want to talk about European identity. Do I have some more time or shall I stop? <laughs> How Two or three minutes more. Okay, then I will tell you another defining moment in Asia again. Um, so after my adventures in Brussels in 2006, Asia was really opening up towards the Caucasus. Um, and uh, we decided to organize the second case to the trip uh, to Caucasus, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. At that time, we couldn't find reliable parties in Armenia, so we could only make it happen in Georgia and Azerbaijan. And it was my first time in Baku, in Azerbaijan, and I was simply so much shocked by what I've seen and experienced there because I would think that, you know, Turkey and Azerbaijan, Turks and Azeris, we're kind of brothers and we know each other very well and I always thought Azerbaijan is definitely a more progressive place than Turkey. So, so when I went there, my entire world just uh, completely <laughs> got uh, shaken. I would like to tell you one particular story. In Baku, uh, we were taken to a camp it was an IDP camp, internally displaced persons camp. There was this war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over this disputed territory called Nagorno-Karabakh. And those people, some 15 years ago, they had to escape from the war and come to Baku and live there with lots of shattered lives and stories. So we went there. Uh, I didn't know we were going there, so I was a bit shocked as well. And I didn't want to enter the house of people, so I was just chatting with one of the guys in the garden. And he told me, you know, um, we don't send our kids to school, we don't work, we just pray every day to God, so that God will give us our lands back and we will go there back, because if I send my kids to school here, or if I you know, start working here, you know, I mean, maybe it will be difficult for me to go back, so I really pray for the God and I believe in God and this will happen. So when I realized that how much these people went through all this pain, suffering, they lost their beloved ones, they had to be displaced. And the way they are supported currently and the way they were trying to survive was very striking because you get lots of humanitarian aid for these people and instead of really empowering them, really like, you know, making them as citizens again, uh, you kind of also uh, play on their emotional uh, conditions. So this was not something that I liked. And I saw how deep the divide between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, but despite all those things, uh, all these killings, all this propaganda and everything, again, I'm so happy that we have Aisha Lokus in Azerbaijan, in Armenia, because I know that these two uh, nations, ethnicities, people, beautiful people, uh, they have... Uh, the uh, power to coexist with one another. They are fully compatible, they are very similar. And in Georgia, you have all those uh, common Armenian and, and Azeri villages, and the level of interaction is so amazing there. It's as if these people have never experienced any war or have never heard the word uh, Karabakh. So, what I am involved in this part of the world, Armenia and Azerbaijan, is uh, creation of some neutral zones. And this is again where Asia can play a very big role. Because of all those traumatized experiences, uh, people really lose touch with reality. And because of the war, and they may also end up at any time in war again, because there are armed clashes across the line of contact, physical contact is not possible. They can't visit each other's countries, they have to meet all the time in third countries, and uh, I mean, so that's the reason why creation of neutral zones, be it blogs, be it websites, is very important. Uh, and also establishment of some joint distance monitoring groups, like for instance, some Armenian youngsters uh, protecting the Azeri cultural heritage in Armenia or monitoring about the situation of there, and Azeri friends doing the same in their own territory and watching out Armenian heritage. 
Uh, I had some more stories to tell, of course, about Kareva, about Armenia, and my stories in Armenia uh, as a Turkish person. Um, uh, but I will just skip that, and that's all. Maybe just one last sentence, I know, I thought too much. I just want to tell you that all this has been possible thanks to Aisha. Without me getting to know Aisha and giving this chance, I would never be able to go through all these experiences. Uh, and build my own identity. Uh, so my life would be uh, certainly uh, void and, and, and senseless. So I'm so grateful for that. And there was this utopia of Strasbourg, I don't know if Frank told you, in uh, Enschede, Frank Bianchi, in 1950s, in, in Wissenburg, some 5,000 students gathered after the war in the French German border, and they literally and physically demolished the border, and that what inspired him to, you know, uh, start with his friends' organization called Aisha. So this is called Utopia of Strasbourg, and I so much believe that Utopia of Strasbourg and Aisha is my identity, and 